been handed uh, down. In terms of, uh, of missing, uh, I can, I, I think first, uh, I think it's worth me saying that obviously any missing uh, child is something that we take serious, uh, extremely seriously, and we'll, there's steps in place to ensure, safeguarding procedures in place to ensure that in those circumstances, uh, an asylum, unaccompanied asylum seeking children are, are, are located. Um, some have gone missing that have subsequently been located, but in terms of, I mean, I appreciate um, this is a long answer, so forgive me. Um, I, one statistic that I think it's worth just giving is that as of the first of this month, there were uh, total missing episodes of 472, uh, and total, sub total subsequently located were 340. The total still missing. Uh, individuals is at a 132, but this, daughter, this data, forgive me, this daughter, data is sourced from Home Office operational databases and does not form part of our regular statistical out, outputs, hence why I think there may have been some issues, but it is, I hope that by providing it now it is useful. Is the Minister aware of the facts? That's the consent. My Lord, is further to the... My lords, my, my lords, um, as, the, as the Right Reverend Prelate has said in September at the High Court hearing, the Home Office agreed a grant of £9.75 million to help Kent County Council manage the maximum number of children it should have in its care. That was 346. However, it was reported last week that the Home Office has still not agreed the funding and worse, the actual number of children that Kent County Council is looking after is currently 519. So when is the government going to deliver on its promise and also ensure that Kent County Council gets the support that it needs from the Home Office? I thank the noble lady for her, her question. I, I think it's a similar question I, I received earlier. I'm more than happy to, uh, to take that away. All I can say is obviously we'll continue to, to work with Kent uh, County Council to tackle the issue. But I, as I say, I will, I will forgive me, I don't actually have the answer in front of me. Uh, but I'm more than happy to take that away uh, with the department after this question. Can I welcome Lord Gascoigne to his place? Bench questions. Um, further to the questions that we've had, uh, would my noble friend not agree that this underlines how important it is for the government to continue to tackle the criminalised gangs who are responsible for bringing many of these children to this country? Yeah. I, I, thank the, I thank my noble friend for his question. As ever, I agree with, with most uh, of the things he says, and I think on this is absolutely right. It is important, as I've said before, to, to recognise that the hotel situation uh, and the pressure that's been put on local authorities is because of. This, this significant rise in the number of crossings. And let's not forget, we talk about children, and, and obviously these are sad circumstances, uh, but these are, this is a result of, of smugglers who put these children at risk in the first place. Third old question, Baroness Sherlock. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, DWP has used forms of AI for some time and we are continuing to investigate new opportunities. This includes looking at how generative AI can help us deliver high quality services to improve, improve customer experience and colleague efficiency. We are aware of the transformative benefits of AI as well as the potential risks. We have created the AI Lighthouse Programme to explore opportunities and we have a framework ensuring that we work safely, ethically and transparently. My Lord, um, this question has become topical since I tabled it, since the, the government has decided to take powers to look into the bank account of every pensioner in the country. But that's made me even keener to understand exactly how DWP is using AI. So can the Minister tell the House, is it used to select people for health reassessments, or deciding who to investigate, or who to sanction? And if so, what safeguards are in place to ensure that it's used transparently and fairly? How do we avoid it becoming a sort of digital version of stop and search? Well, I hope I can reassure the noble Baroness that we already have a proven track record in delivering technology in a responsible and a well-governed way. And we have extended our governance to include an AI steering board and assurance and advisory group. DWP always ensures appropriate safeguards are in place for the proportionate ethical and legal use of data with internal monitoring protocols adhered to. Can, can I perhaps further reassure her 
that uh, the Cabinet Office, Central Digital and Data Office, has recognised our Lighthouse programme, Safe Acceleration Framework, as an exemplar for AI development in government. My Lords, My Lords given that the DWP's proposed total expenditure for 2023-24 is a staggering £279.3 billion, can my noble friend tell the House whether this uh, AI and use of AI will contribute and is contributing to cost efficiencies within the department? Well, I can reassure my noble friend that it, that it will. Uh, can I just perhaps give a bit of granular detail, which is a 2021 DSIT report highlights the potential impact of AI on the UK labour market, um, and this includes, of course, uh, DWP. Um, that um, automation is forecast to increase, rising from an estimated 7% to 30%. But perhaps I can sort of reassure her that um, with the changes, uh, there will be uh, a, net, uh, a net gain, I think. We uh, have an average of about 900,000 employees per quarter, moving from one job to another. So I think I can reassure her that my department's employees will reduce, but there will be other opportunities uh, for those in AI. Um, government is rolling out, as the Minister has said, a, comp a massively complex new systems with um, significant risks to claimants, whilst not having got their original systems in order. Uh, we hear reports constantly of backlogs at the Future Pension Centre, of payments for national insurance credits being lost within the system, and more and more historic pension errors coming to light when it comes to things like home responsibilities protection. Can the Noble Viscount the Minister update the House on the steps to get those existing systems in order and what learning exercises will be carried out to ensure that no such errors will be carried forward on the new and potentially more powerful systems which the Noble Viscount has outlined? Well, we're certainly working uh, very hard uh, to, uh, to uh, look at the delays and to mitigate the delays, and AI will be, uh, over time, a game-changer for that. But to manage and mitigate risk, we've produced a risk framework in line with the Department of Science, Innovation and Technology. So we're setting out AI governance and approach to AI enablement, which will be transformational. I pick up on what my noble friend said about digital stop and search. Because there's growing concern about the potential for hidden bias in the use of algorithms to detect social security fraud. What steps have DWP taken to prevent such bias with potentially discriminatory outcomes? And this raises an important point because we are committed to building trust in our use of AI and are fully aware of the risks of the technology as discussed at, uh, as it happens at the UK AI Safety Summit. So where AI is used to assist its activities in prevention and detection of fraud within UC applications, uh, DWP always ensures appropriate safeguards. And bias is something which we're very alive to. It will very much depend on the input of data. And we have got some uh, risk profiles in place to ensure that we uh, have adopt best practice in that effect. My, my laws, given the appalling amount of fraud within the DWP costing billions a year, surely we should welcome the fact that the DWP are using AI and algorithms to actually target this problem. But the key presumably is once AI has reached a conclusion, actual human beings should then review the situation. And can you tell the House, do, do the DWP have internal quality assessment procedures that are robust? A couple of questions there. So we continue to explore the potential of AI in combating fraud, and this includes the Integrated Risk and Intelligence Service, using AI to, to assist in identifying possible fraud in processing universal credit advances. But to answer the, my noble friend's question, importantly, DWP does not use AI to replace human judgment when considering the potential for incorrectness to either determine or deny a payment to a claimant. And both the NAO and the ICO who have looked at this issue recently found no areas of immediate concern. The issue that my noble friend raised about uh, access to millions of people's bank accounts hmm. came at the uh, very late stage in the dealings on the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill, at the report stage of the uh, Commons dealings of that bill. 
Can the noble lord, the minister, outline why such contentious measures were only introduced after a line-by-line -line consideration of the bill in the elected house? Why did the government refuse the opposition's request that the legislation go back to committee stage as the online safety bill in the last session? And can the noble lord, the minister, justify why this very, very contentious piece of legislation is being rushed through? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not going to be drawn into answering questions on that, but what I can tell her is, is that it's, a, it's very important that actually the scrutiny of the bill is done in an effective way, and of course this House is very, uh, very good at, at doing that. So what is very important, which I have mentioned before, is the trust uh, that must be used in AI solutions, and this must be a prevalent issue amongst all the users of AI. Uh, uh, will this AI enable people who are on social security to get a better deal, to get off of social security, so therefore tapping in to the skills and ability of millions of people who are caught in the Bastille of poverty and social security. Yes, and I think I can uh, outline that uh, a lot of uh, very good work has been done so far, so that the work, as I said earlier, still has to include human judgment. But the AI is being used uh, to assist with uh, improving on repetitive processes for staff. Uh, we're introducing conversational platforms for triaging, which again will lead directly to have a, having a human face. And the whole point is to uh, speed up the process and to include more human uh, judgment in ensuring that more people get into work and faster. Lord, say if he's seen the website Paradox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, if not, would he say he would look at it? Could he say whether the department is examining whether the body concept which is developed there could be used within the department he represents and in other government departments and what the consequences of using that in government service will be? I'm not aware of that, but I will most certainly look at it. Will Lord the Minister say what percentage of staff within the department are fully skilled and trained on the use, application and the um, assessment of AI decisions? I will certainly need to write to the Noble Lord with those very specific figures. Um, Noble Lord, the Minister has said repeatedly that he wants the public to have trust in the use of AI in the, um, uh, in, in the system. Could he tell us, therefore, what proportion of cases where AI has been used, is it then subsequently checked by a human? And will he publish the results of that analysis to show whether or not the AI decisions are the same as the human decisions, or perhaps better or worse? Well, what I can do in answering that is to give uh, the Noble Lord some reassurance of the processes that we have in place, because AI is an evolving iterative process. And I think it's very important to highlight the fact that we have a test and learn approach so that we, we uh, must uh, proceed with extreme caution in terms of what we are doing. Um, so test and learn means we need to get to a point um, where we are uh, assured that uh, this will work and that nobody will have, uh, be affected detrimentally and then we can accelerate uh, the uh, programmes that we have. Fourth oral question, Arnes Ritchie of Downpatrick. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. The Government welcomes the Cancer Research UK report Longer Better Lives, which rightly highlights progress made against cancer. We have invested over £100 million into cancer research in 2021-22 through the National Institute for Health and Care Research. We are working closely with research partners in all sectors, and I am confident the Government continued commitment to cancer research will help us build on that progress, leading to continued improvement for all cancer patients. Could I thank the Noble Lord the Minister for his answer, and it is quite clear that that manifesto highlights the priorities required for tackling rising cancer rates with a growing ageing population, including the need for more investment in research, greater disease prevention, earlier diagnosis through screening, better tests and treatments, as well as cutting NHS waiting lists and investing in more staff. Could the Noble Lord the Minister outline what steps the Government will take to implement this strategy, allied with resources and updated infrastructure in all hospitals? 
Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I'd first like to thank the work that Noble Lady does in this field and also welcome the, the, the manifesto, specifically on rebuilding the global um, position on research. Um, we've actually done a good job on that. We are now gone from a position of 26% of the clinical trial responses being in the time to international standards to over 80%. On the prevention, the biggest prevention method anyone could take is the smoking, because um, that's the biggest cause of lung cancer, as we know, and uh, so we're introducing that to uh, prevent um, um, smoking going forward. Early diagnosis, we've introduced an excellent example in terms of lung cancer, where we used to have the situation whereby 60% um, of people weren't detected until they were stage four, when that's often too late. Now, through these mobile lung cancer units, we're detecting 70% at stage one or two, where they've got a 60% chance of survival. Um, across the field, we're doing a lot on this that we can feel proud of. I have to continue the, continue the research question. You can't see. Does the minister recognise that one of the causative factors of, can, of, of cancer is obesity. Yeah. And 40 million people in this country are obese. Yeah. And it's costing, it, the latest estimate, a hundred billion pounds a year. Is it not time to adopt the technique, the campaign that Norman Fowler successfully conducted in the 1980s? because he had the courage to state the truth and make sure it was successful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, and we are taking extensive action on the obesity front because, uh, as well as a major cause of cancer, uh, it's a major cause of a lot of ill health. Um, in fact, if you look at the research on it, we've taken action against the 96% of reasons um, which are really uh, increasing calorific intake in terms of what people buy in the supermarkets. Uh, so we've taken a lot of action and things such as the sugar tax, uh, drinks levy has decreased uh, sugar by at least 14% in drinks. My Lord, sir, continue, uh, I congratulate the CRUK in producing this magnificent report on uh, manifesto. Continuing with the theme of research, the report identifies the necessity to further close the funding gap in research will be about a billion pounds for in the next decade. Research in key areas where our scientists are leaders in the world, in areas of early detection of cancer using cell-free DNA, technologies such as messenger RNA for vaccine production using genomes and early protein expressions for early diagnosis. I know the, the minister mentioned key areas of reducing lung cancer said, using the known technology, but it's in discovery science that we need to increase the fund, particularly when the government funding falls far behind the charity funding, particularly from CRUK. Well, um, I, I absolutely agree that uh, the research funding is key in this. That's why I mentioned the 100 million that we spent in 2021-22. Uh, also, the Medical Research uh, Council are spending 125 million per annum on cancer research. And that's allowing us to introduce vital things. The point of care cancer treatments, for instance, that our regulators have brought in ahead of anyone else in Europe, showing the key flexibility our regulators now have, meaning that people can have individualised cancer care. So I absolutely agree with the noble lord that we need to be investing in these sorts of activities. My lords, I recently met with one of our excellent specialist cancer hospitals, and they explained that they have tens of millions of pounds in the bank that they would like to spend on facilities and equipment to support new cancer treatments, but they can't. And the only blocker, my lords, is that they cannot get a certificate from the local integrated care board to authorise the capital expenditure. But frankly, I was astonished by this, and I wanted to invite the noble lord, to, the minister, to explain, in terms that even I can understand, why the government thinks it's a good idea to prevent a world-leading hospital trust from spending money it already has on much-needed cancer research facilities. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I'm, I'm not clear of the details of the case, and I'll happily take it up with the noble lord afterwards, but I would totally agree that clearly we, we want our leading institutions spending money where they can really impact change, and that's exactly what we're doing. My lords, we're about, whilst 
Any benefits of early cancer diagnosis will not be realised without timely treatment. The government is continuing to not nearly meet the NHS target of some 85% of patients starting treatment within 62 days of an urgent referral for suspected cancer. So what assessment has the government made of treatment delays on death rates as well as anxiety levels for patients? And if the noble Lord the Minister does accept the statistics that increased waiting lists for cancer treatment predate the pandemic, what will the government now be doing differently? Well, absolutely, we need to bear down on cancer wait times. That's why we've been expanding supply in this area. That's what the 130 plus CDCs are all about, which have done 5 million tests. That's what the 50 surgical hubs have uh, been about. That means that we're treating 26% more cancer patients this year than last year, and we've managed to reduce the 62 day backlog uh, by 27%. Absolutely more work needs to be done, but we are getting on top of it. The problem that the Minister faces is that things may well be getting worse. Because of the extensive waiting lists, one major cancer centre in London is saying that the number of people being referred to the cancer pathway has rocketed because of the large number of people on other waiting lists. So that the number that they are now seeing for the cancer pathway is only 2% only of them actually end up having cancer. Now, at one level, you can celebrate that. But we know that that's not because the numbers with cancer are reducing. It is because people are being referred into the pathway because it's the only way they'll be seen <laughs> at the moment. Um, no, I, I, I don't believe that's why people are being referred. It's to give them peace of mind. So it is that people know their own bodies and they know if they're concerned that they have cancer that we want to put their mind at risk. And so I am familiar with the statistic. Actually, I, I heard it's 95% of people who go to these referrals thankfully don't end up with cancer, but boy, they've got peace of mind that we're able to give them that assurance. Son, who's an oncologist, as the Minister knows, one of the most serious forms of cancer and growing at this time is melanoma, and the melanoma charities are campaigning to reduce the VAT on sun cream in order to reduce the incidence of this terrible cancer. Has the government come to a view on this reduction of VAT? <coughs> I, I don't uh, think it has come to a view, but um, I do understand the point, and I will take that back uh, to the Department and the Treasury. Uh, we're doing reasonably well with certain cancers, with leukaemias, with breast cancer, but we're doing very badly with pancreatic cancer and colon cancer. We, most of these are asymptomatic for a long while before it's too late. We desperately need a test. Uh, that will indicate that there is a disease coming. Uh, what research is being done in this area and what money is being spent on it? Um, the, the noble lord is absolutely correct. Whilst we made good progress in many areas, pancreatic cancer is um, the hardest one and uh, the one where we uh, uh, need to uh, do more. And that's true all around the world because of the symptoms are so hard to detect. I will happily write with the details in terms of uh, giving the answer on that. My Lords, that concludes oral questions for today. We now come to questions to the Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Affairs. First oral question, Lord Robertson of Port Ellen. I seek leave to uh, ask the question in my name and the order of him. Um, my Lords, since February 2022, we've committed over £4.7 billion humanitarian and economic support to Ukraine. This year, the UK is providing a billion dollars of support to Ukraine's budget through loan guarantees and £127 million of humanitarian support for Ukraine and Moldova. During my recent visit to Ukraine, I announced further support to Ukrainians directly impacted by the invasion, £10 million for Ukraine's Red Cross Society to provide medical supplies, £7 million to volunteer organisations delivering humanitarian assistance. My Lords, we will continue to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. Hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. My Lords, I thank the, uh, the Foreign Secretary for his answer and I refer to my entry in the Register of Interest. 
Uh, can I say well, how much we all welcome him here today for this first in monthly interrogation in the House of Lords, which I'm sure he's likely to enjoy. After all, by his very presence in this chamber, he's given a fillip to those of us who have to go around saying, do you know who I used to be? <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, can I commend him um, on the fact that his very first visit um, as Foreign Secretary was to Ukraine? Uh, because the Ukrainians are not just fighting for their country and for their land and for their lives, they're also fighting very much for us. And surely the fact is that they don't actually need more visits and more speeches. They need more weapons, they need more guns, they need more ammunition, and they need more equipment. Uh, and in that context, therefore, could I ask the Foreign Secretary this question? Why was there no additional military aid offered in the Chancellor of the Exchequer's autumn budget? And why is there no perspective on military aid for 2024 when the 2023 money is going to run out in a few weeks' time in March next year? Yeah. Well, can I thank the noble lord for his question and also say that I absolutely remember not only who he is but who he used to be, and he was an incredibly effective Secretary General of NATO and did fantastic work. Um, and it's actually worth recalling some of the things that he said to um, President Putin back in, in the day in 2002, 2003 that are very relevant today. To answer his question directly, I mean, I think we have given 4.6 billion pounds of military support. We will continue to give the support that is necessary. One of the things I found very impressive about going to Ukraine is how much they rate our support, how they refer to us as their number one partner. And it's been very good to see that. I think the one area where we can do more is in trying to mobilise the British defence industries to produce um, the stocks that are needed rather than simply running down stocks. We can also work with European allies to s sometimes if they are reluctant to give support, they may be able to backfill some of our capabilities and we can give more. But I'm absolutely clear the military support is essential. That is what is helping uh, Ukraine to succeed. My Lord's in uh, joining in the welcome to my noble friend and wishing him every possible success. Does he share my concern at the slowing up of the counteroffensive in Ukraine? And will he make it a particular study of his to see what can be done to increase the weapons supply so that these brave people, who, as Lord Robertson said, are fighting for us, do succeed? I thank my noble friend for his question and well remember when we were on the campaign trail together in Staffordshire. He was rather more successful. Uh, he fought Staffordshire South, I fought Stafford and Stafford fought back rather effectively at the time. <laughs> um, what I would say to him is I think we should actually be clear about the success that the Ukrainians are having. I mean it's not much remarkable and of course uh, the land picture is one thing but what's happened on the Black Sea where the Ukrainians have pushed the Russian Navy right back across the Black Sea, um, sinking a number of their ships and opening up this grain corridor for ships. And that is essential because ultimately we need the Ukrainian economy to grow. They are now, ships are sailing, exports are moving, the economy is growing. They, they um, destroyed about a fifth of Russia's attack helicopters in, in one night recently. So yes, there's been a difficult picture on land, but overall big success. And combine that with the fact that this country is now knocking at the door of both NATO and the EU. That is a very positive picture for Ukraine that I think it's important we get across. Welcome the uh, noble lord to his position uh, and to your lordship's house. Um, my lords, it's clear that whatever the outcome of the war, economic support on a considerable scale is going to be needed in Ukraine for many years to come. This has to be an international effort led by Europe. And if there's, to be an inter if there's to be a coordinated European response, the UK has got to be at the heart of it. So what institutional framework involving the EU and the UK does the noble law propose to ensure that economic support is provided in the most efficient and effective way? Yeah. Well, I thank the noble law for his question. I think there are, there are two answers to that. One is the 
uh, the EPC, this new body that brings together EU members with other European countries, including the United Kingdom. That is a good forum in which to talk about our support for Ukraine. I think the other is the Ukraine Recovery Conference, which we hosted here in June, and that will be a regular fix to other countries will host it, and that brings together everybody to try and make sure we maximise the economic support. And I think it marshalled something like $60 billion of economic support for Ukraine. So I think there are ways of making sure we combine effectively with European partners and others to get this uh, essential assistance in place. My lords, in, my lords, in answer to Lord Robertson's question about what the government is committing in the way of weapons uh, to Ukraine for 20, uh, 2024, the Foreign Secretary made lots, of nice, uh, made lots of nice phrases and comments, but I wonder if, you, if the Foreign Secretary can actually answer Lord Robertson's question. What commitment can the Lord Foreign Secretary make in terms of wh what weapons and how much are we spending on weapons for 2024 uh, to, for Ukraine? Well, I thank the, the, my noble friend for the, the question. We, we, I, I don't have the figure here for what 2024 will provide. All I can say is we are absolutely committed to continuing to support Ukraine at the level or even ahead of what we've done. And to be clear about this, it's not just the scale of support, it's the type of support. One of the things the UK has done, and I pay tribute to my um, successes as Prime Minister in this, is always being ahead of the game. Lots of people were worried about giving them uh, N-law uh, uh, anti-tank missiles. We went ahead and did it. Then others did. Lots of people were worried about giving support in terms of tanks. We did it and others followed. Same again with long-range artillery, and crucially the same again with the Storm Shadow missiles, the long-range fires, so-called, which have made such a difference uh, right across uh, the battle space. So we'll continue to support them at that level, asking them what it is they most need and making sure our support is effective. I just want to reiterate, as I have done before, our full support for the government's actions, militarily and economically, and humanitarian support for Ukraine. But the noble lord said we must remain ahead of the game. And one clear thing that we need to ensure is that the people who have caused this war, the government that has caused this war, pays for the rebuilding of Ukraine. And of course, the EU has already set out a plan to repurpose Russian frozen assets. Canada has passed laws to do it, and the US has drafted laws to do it. So when will we see this government act and not be behind the game? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me thank the noble lord for his question. I think it's an extremely important point. It's one of the things I've looked at since uh, taking office. I'm going to Washington this week and we'll be discussing that specific point uh, with my counterparts in the United States. Because to me, it's clear, you know, this is uh, confiscated money that is for the benefit um, uh, of, uh, that should be taken away from the, 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 the Russians that possess it and should be used uh, in, instead, as it were, of reparations coming later, use it as a down payment now. Now, of course, there are all sorts of legal concerns, all sorts of concerns about precedent, all sorts of concerns about chilling effects on investment and the rest of it. But I'm with him, as it were, on the moral and emotional stance that this is the right thing to do. Let's see if we can get it done. My Lords, I wonder if the uh, Noble Lord, the Minister, could comment on his uh, department's assessment of reports that not only uh, is Turkey, has Turkey vastly increased its trade with Russia, but also that Turkish ports are being used for arms smuggling and in some cases exporting dual purpose uh, goods into Russia, thereby helping them. I wonder what the assessment is and what we might be able to do about that. Well, can I thank the right Reverend Pradit for his question? I think he's absolutely right. One of the things we have to do is look right across the world at where there is potential for countries exporting dual-use goods and other goods of concern to Russia so that they can build more uh, weapons and build more drones and all the rest of it. And he's absolutely right that, that there are concerns about Turkey. I raised, that, raised those specifically with the Turkish Foreign Minister um, when I, I, I met him uh, recently um, at the NATO conference. There are also concerns about other countries, and I can tell him and, and all noble lords we're going through country by country, concern by concern, and trying to track down where those dual use goods are coming from and trying to take the appropriate <laughs> measures, including sanctions, where necessary. Question, Lord Folks of Cumberland. My lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper.
My Lords, the UK's position is clear. The Belarusian regime must release all political prisoners immediately and unconditionally and ensure free and fair elections. The UK has led international pressure on Belarus. We co-founded the International Accountability Platform for Belarus to build the evidence of the brutal repression that the regime is responsible for. Uh, we have sanctioned over 100 individuals and entities for human rights violations, and we co-sponsored UN resolutions and investigations at the OSCE in Vienna to shine a spotlight on human rights in Belarus. My well, Lords, I am grateful to the Foreign Secretary for that answer as far as it goes, uh, but we must never forget that Lukashenko and his regime supported the Russians in the illegal invasion of Ukraine. <laughs> And they have imprisoned over 1,500 people, including Stepan Latipov, who I have adopted under the Libereco adoption scheme. Uh, and these prisoners have no immediate prospect of release. And meanwhile, Lukashenko's cronies are going around the world, travelling, uh, acquiring assets freely. Now, the government over the last two years, have, the UK government, have said they're going to impose more individual uh, sanctions on, on the uh, Lukashenko cronies, but nothing has happened. Will the government now look at increasing the sanctions to make sure that pressure is put on to the Lukashenko regime? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me say to the noble lord that I completely admire what he has done to keep the spotlight on Belarus and the work he and others have done on the all-party group. I think it is hugely to, to his credit and to the, the House's credit. Uh, what I would say is we have sanctioned 182 individuals and entities. We keep looking at what more can be done. We never announce potential names or sanctions before we do them, for obvious reasons, but we keep it under review. I'm looking at it very carefully. And he's right. We should be clear. This is Europe's totalitarian regime. They randomly confiscate people's mobile phones to see who they've been contacting, what social media they're following. Trade unions have been dissolved and their leaders imprisoned. Waving a Ukrainian flag is against the law and can result in a jail sentence. And there are 1,500 people who are political prisoners. So we absolutely agree with the aim of his question, and we will keep using the sanctions and other tools as appropriate. I also welcome the Foreign Secretary to his uh, position, uh, and I agree with him with regards to the rebellious regime. Uh, can I remind him what he said in his famed immigration speech when he said, I quote, we will introduce a new visa to roll out the red carpet for those that offer serious investment to the UK. We now know that uh, a number of Belarus business people bought a very large proportion of London property as a result of this golden visa route. I have supported every Belarus sanction that we have debated in this House, but there is nothing in the government's new development white paper that offers any new support for human rights defenders or democracy activists within this conflict. So why is that the case? And can the Foreign Secretary reassure me that of those 182 individuals that he mentioned, not a single one currently, cur currently continues to enjoy UK preferential visa access? Well, let me make the point to the noble lord who asked an important question, which is, yes, of course we introduced entrepreneur visas to try and attract uh, bright talent to the UK to help grow the economy, but that does not mean you should give visas to people who have come by that money uh, wrongly. And actually, one of the things I did do as Prime Minister was introduce, announce the London Property Register, which ha is now coming in, that's going to make a huge difference in terms of confiscating people's ill-gotten gains and returning it to the countries and to the people from which it came um, so they can benefit. On his specific question, um, I I'm very happy to take that way and, and, and look at it more. But I think it is important to recognise we use the sanctions, we'll keep using the sanctions, and we're watching closely what Belarus is doing. I, I also um, welcome the Foreign Secretary to his uh, new role, and uh, I am glad to hear of his concern about uh, political prisoners and the use of sanctions against those who are responsible uh, largely for their being inc incarcerated. Mm. Um, I raise in that context the fact that Lukashenko currently is visiting China yeah. and visiting President Xi. And so I'm concerned as to whether we are making the same efforts in relation to the sanctioning of people responsible for imprisoning people, for example, in Hong Kong and using, using national security law, because Jimmy Lai is there 
in prison face, facing trumped-up charges, and he was a voice for democracy in, in Hong Kong. And uh, I, I just wondered, in the short period of time when you've been in your office, have you got to know about uh, Jimmy Lai, and are you raising issues about his incarceration? I thank the, the noble lady for her question. Yes, I am aware of the case of, of Jimmy Lai, and it's very important that we raise these cases, including that one, when we have interactions with the, um, with the Chinese government, and that's exactly what I've done. Well, Lord, can I bring the Foreign Secretary back to the issue of sanctions as raised by the noble Lord Fuchs? And I speak as somebody who's also a godparent to one of the political prisoners in Belarus. He's spoken of the sanctions, and I think he's aware of the concerns of the loopholes that have been exposed in that. I think what the House would like to know is whether or not he is personally confident that having identified those, the government is now more effective in monitoring and enforcement, because they're not effective if they're not properly enforced, if they're not properly monitored, there's really very little point. So can he say if he is personally confident in their effectiveness, and if he isn't, can he say what measures he will take to improve the position? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for what she said. Uh, the Honourable Lady for what she said. Noble Lady, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get there eventually. Um, I, I haven't uh, asked the office specifically for a sort of analysis of the weakness of the sanctions and travel bans and asset freezes that we put in place, but with the question she asked, I'm very happy to go and do that to see if there are ways that the system isn't working. I think with all these things, we have to, to sense check them. I would just say one thing, which is the, the thing I announced about the International Accountability Platform for Belarus. That sort of sounds like a sort of terrible set of initials. But what that actually is, is making sure that we are supporting all the NGOs and others that are looking at all the human rights abuses in Belarus so that they are properly charted and written down, so they may be able to form the case of criminal cases against people working in that regime uh, into the future. I just think it's important to do that, but I'll certainly take away the point she makes. She will have, uh, be aware that uh, President Lukashenko and President Putin are the only members of an exclusive club of leaders whose countries do not recognize the ju jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. Does he share the view of the former Home Secretary that we should join that club. <laughs> I, I can go back as far as 2005 and point the noble lord to speeches that I made that said, you know, we always have to put our national interest first, whether that is the need to deport dangerous terrorists, whether it is the need to have uh, an immigration policy that works for our country. I believe that is consistent with remaining um, in the ECHR, but as I found as Prime Minister, there are occasions when the ECR, ECHR makes judgments, as they did in, in, on the issue of prisoner votes, uh, when they said that it was absolutely essential that we legislated instantly to give prisoners the vote, and I said I didn't think that was the case. I think that should be settled by Houses of Parliament and the ECHR back down. So that sort of flexibility may well be necessary in the future. Yeah. Yeah. My Lord, sir, Foreign Secretary will be aware that the incredibly evil and vile Wagner Group were allowed to move to Belarus after the, the mutiny in Russia was resolved. Does he share my concern about this? And would he raise this with the US Secretary of State when he sees him next week? Well, I think my, um, noble friend, no, the noble lord is absolutely right. My noble friend is absolutely right that you know, Belarus, uh, Belarus has been the number one supporter of Putin's uh, illegal uh, invasion of Ukraine, and they should be held, for account, they should be held to account for that. And uh, I, I'm certainly happy to raise that issue with Secretary Blinken when I see him this week. Can I take the Noble Lord of the Minister back to a previous answer he gave around the property register, which is indeed a, a very important step forward in terms of understanding whether corrupt individuals from Belarus or elsewhere are buying property in the UK. He may be aware that there are concerns that people can still behind, hide behind beneficial trusts. As Foreign Secretary, will he work with his colleagues in government to try and get us to the next stage of transparency so corrupt individuals are not able to buy property and still hide their ownership? I thank the Noble Lord for his question. I'm very happy to take that away. I mean, I think, actually, the government I led and this government has made progress on this. As he says, we've got the uh, register of property. A number of properties have, therefore, been taken back from their 
uh, owners, and that money has been returned to the countries from which it's been stolen. And added to that, of course, we've got the registers of beneficial ownership, including the public registers of beneficial ownership, which I announced back at the G8 in 2013. And we are making huge progress on that globally and also with our own overseas territories. And we need to do the same with our Crown dependencies. All of this is essential if we're going to fight corruption. Third question, Baroness de Souza. My Lords, <coughs> I beg leave to ask the question standing on the order paper in my name. Um, as the noble Baroness knows, the situation with respect to Afghanistan is very difficult. My officials engage with the regime on priorities, including humanitarian access, without conferring any legitimacy on the Taliban. We are reviewing the recommendations of the UN Special Coordinator's report to support the Afghan people and improve international relations. Specifically on the question of Pakistan deportation of Afghan refugees, we do not support these actions. I met with the Pakistan Foreign Minister on Friday in Dubai and raised this question um, with him. Pakistan does have a history of welcoming vulnerable refugees, and we will continue to urge the government to respect the human rights of all Afghans. Uh, I thank the Noble Lord, the Foreign Secretary, for his answer. Uh, my Lord, the lack of recognition of the Taliban Authority has inadvertently provided the Taliban and Pakistan with unrestricted freedom and influence over <coughs> policies in Afghanistan. And a current concern, as the noble Lord has pointed out, is the enforced resettlement of thousands of refugees from Pakistan to Afghanistan. The Taliban policy of relocating Shia minorities in Sunni areas has dangerous implications, my lords. What measures, including further negotiations with the Pakistan government, can the, government, can the UK government take to avert potential religious and other conflicts in the region? Um, well, I thank the noble lady for her, her, her question and her deep interest in this subject. I think the reason the Pakistan government is doing this is they are concerned about the activities of the Pakistan Taliban within Afghanistan. And this is their way of trying to get the Taliban government to address that. One of the points I made to them is that might well be counterproductive, and we think this is um, the wrong move. So what I can say to her is we will continue to raise this with the Pakistan authorities at every level and on every occasion. Obviously, we have a very specific British interest to make sure that any of those people, Afghans, who worked for our um, authorities in Afghanistan who have a right to come and settle here under any of the, of the two schemes we have, that they are not inadvertently pushed back into Afghanistan. That's our sort of number one concern. On the issue of the regime and recognition, I'm sure there'll be other questions about this, but I mean, fundamentally, as the House knows, the Foreign, Policy, Foreign Office always says that we recognize states and not governments, which is, I know, right. But on this occasion, when you look at this regime and what it is responsible for, it bans women from working for the United Nations. It's the only country in the world to ban girls from secondary school. Um, it restricts uh, access of women to parks, playgrounds, other public spaces, and has a complete ban on women attending university. So I think we're some way off that move of ever recognising this regime. We need to keep the pressure on for it to change its approach. My lords, the no my lords, the, the, the noble lord, the foreign secretary, um, may recall when he was prime minister, meeting uh, members of Afghanistan Commando Force 333, a counter narcotics unit that later became a counter insurgency unit, created, trained, mentored, and funded by His Majesty's government. He will be appalled to know that former and deserving members of CF 333 and the similarly created and funded ATF 444 wrongly were refused resettlement under the Arab process. Abandoned, several have been killed and or tortured. About 100 333 and 444 were rejected applic applicants and in Pakistan, fearing imminent deportation and a death sentence. Will they agree to meet with me and a delegation of noble and noble and gallant lords and ladies so that we can explain the compelling case for an urgent review of the rejected or rescinded approvals of their settlement application. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I thank the Noble Lord for his question, and of course he has great experience of this, having been the Defence Secretary for a prolonged period when we were in that fight in, in Afghanistan, and he knows exactly 
uh, um, the, the, uh, about the issues he's raising. What I'm very happy to take away the point he makes about those two units and to look at them specifically. What I can tell him is that under the Afghan relocation and assistance policy, the Arab scheme, I think 12,200 people have been repatriated so far. And of course, there's the the Foreign Office scheme for which I'm responsible, which is the Afghan Citizen Resettlement Scheme, which has the capacity of up to 20,000 people. So I'm very happy to take away the specific points that he makes and, and see what we can do to help. My Lords, after 9-11, when the West went into Afghanistan, we encouraged the women to come forward and play their part in public life, and they bravely responded. As my noble friend has just said, since the Taliban came in in 2021, they have stopped women having access to education and they have basically pushed them back into their homes. Many are calling this gender apartheid. How are we going to assure that the women of Afghanistan can play their part in their country going forward? Well, I, I thank my noble friend for her question. I mean, it's appalling how women are treated in Afghanistan, and I gave some of the points earlier about access to school, access to education, to university, even to public spaces. Um, and I think we have to use the maximum leverage that we do have. And of course, while we do need to help people in Afghanistan who are facing um, very, very great food insecurity and huge difficulties in terms of um, shelter and livelihoods, and we are helping, we can do that through United Nations organizations rather than through the government of Afghanistan. I think we should continue to do that and use the pressure we have to, to say to the regime that it needs to change its ways with respect to women and girls. The Foreign Secretary just mentioned the ban. No, well, uh, the Foreign Secretary has already mentioned that there is a danger of people who have Arab entitlement who are in Pakistan being sent back to Afghanistan and hoping that we can persuade Pakistan not to let them go back. Could he show the House the government's commitment to people who, are, who have Arab entitlement or ACRS entitlement and talk with his, his hon. Friends in the other place, the Home Secretary, the Secretary of State for Leveling Up and the Cabinet Office about ensuring that every single person who has Arab entitlement is able to come from Pakistan or Afghanistan to this country. What are we doing? Because we owe those people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The noble lady is completely right. It, this is a cross-government effort. We have to make sure we identify these people, we contact these people, and let them know about their right to come and live here. And then we have to work out across the different departments, departments of government how to make sure that can happen in a way that works for them and their families. And I, I can tell her that that's exactly what's happening in government at the moment. My lords, when uh, the noble lord just mentioned the ban on UN aid workers in Afghanistan. And in January, uh, in, I'm glad to see the noble Lord, Lord Ahmed here, in January, in response to an urgent question, he stressed the need for the Islamic world to speak out. Therefore, I welcome very much his recent discussions with the Pakistan authorities. But can he tell us what he's doing to support the noble Lord Ahmed in ensuring that we expand that, ensure that other voices are heard and condemning this isolated regime from banning women from attending hospitals and other humanitarian support is incredibly damaging. Yeah. Well, I think from what I've seen in the last um, three weeks is that my, um, the, the noble lord, my noble friend, uh, is incredibly active in his travels, particularly around the Middle East, North Africa, and, and many, um, much of the of the Muslim world and, and is an incredibly effective spokesman for the government to actually try and make a change on these issues. I think one of the things that's necessary is to make sure that um, those states who often privately um, speak very frankly about these things, that it becomes part of their public narrative. And I think the work we do on that will be really essential. My Lords, now that, um, uh, now that the government has helpfully dropped its requirement that suitable housing in the UK be secured before Afghans may travel from Pakistan to the UK, and returning to what the noble lord described as his number one priority, could he tell the House how many UK visas have been issued to those Afghans trapped in Pakistan, who we know qualify under one of the two main schemes that we've initiated, 
since the policy was reversed on housing requirements? Um, I thank the noble lady for her question. I don't have the figures s since that change, but the overall figures are that Arup has seen 12,200 people repatriated, and the ACRS scheme has a capacity of 20,000. Uh, uh, perhaps I can keep her up to date and the House up to date about the figures as they, as they progress. We're obviously doing everything we can to contact those people who are, who, who, who are on the Pakistan-Afghan border, but I think it is important at the same time to make clear to the Pakistan government that it would be unacceptable for them to deport anybody that has the right to come here. Fourth question, Madam Lesley. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, last week I met with Vice President Sefcovic where we discussed issues including the Windsor framework and support for Ukraine and the Middle East. An important part of my role is to make the UK-EU relationship work to deliver on UK interests, including on migration, energy security and trade. The Trade and Cooperation Agreement remains the basis of our relationship with the EU and we are committed to maximising its opportunities. My Lords, I welcome uh, the noble lord very much, particularly because I know he's committed very strongly to the union of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and also because he's the only cabinet, member of the cabinet who hasn't had anything to do with either the protocol or the Windsor framework. So he comes with, with clean hands. Um, but I do hope that the uh, foreign secretary, the noble lord, does understand the difficulties that the Windsor frame is causing to people in Northern Ireland. Business is not sending goods to Northern Ireland anymore, and the breakup of the internal UK market. So could I ask him to give a commitment to the people of Northern Ireland when he next meets the European Union that he will actually talk to them about alternatives which could be brought forward with modern technology with trust and with common sense that could do away with the Irish Sea border and not be dividing our own country. Um, well, can I thank the noble lady for her question and, and say it's um, very nice to be reunited with her. My first job in politics was actually the candidate's researcher at the Vauxhall by-election, uh, <laughs> where <laughs> um, she got elected and my office was picketed every day by local residents. So, but at least we've, we've ended up in the same place. Look, as she said, I had nothing to do with negotiating the Windsor framework, and so I can say this with, with true meaning. I think it was a superb negotiation. I mean, the EU never said it would never reopen the withdrawal agreement, and they did. Uh, they never, and I say this with real feeling, um, give an emergency break, and yet they did when it came to, to Stormont, and they never really make exceptions for single market access for non-single market countries, and yet they have. So I absolutely understand her concerns and, and worries about it, but I think it was a good negotiation. I think it can fulfil um, the seven tests that the that Democratic Unionists have put forward, and I know my right hon. Friend, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, is, is working extremely hard to try and put the um, institutions back together again. My lords, my lords, my lords, the sec my lords, my lords. My the Foreign Secretary mentioned that one of the areas of common interest was indeed migration. Given the signing of a treaty with Rwanda today, could the Foreign Secretary tell the House what discussions he had with the EU and its member states on that? And can he also tell the House whether Parliament will have the choice to debate and agree that new treaty? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What I'd say to the uh, noble lady is one of the things I think has most changed in my seven-year um, absence from all of this is that the debate in, in, within EU countries about migration has completely changed. Many more of them are extremely worried about the scale of illegal migration and the need to do some quite creative thinking about how you can deal with this problem. So, yes, I did um, speak about this with um, uh, Commissioner Sefcovic. Uh, I fully support what the government is doing because we have to stop these illegal boat crossings. There is nothing more destructive to a country's immigration system than to have a continued and very visible amount of illegal migration. And so I think that the approach that is being taken to break the criminal gangs and their ability to say to people, we will get you to the shore of the UK and from then on you're safe. We have to stop that. And that's what the Rwanda plan is all about. And I'm sure it can be debated uh, 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 to, to great extent in this House. And, and I'm sure my colleagues will be very happy to take part. My Lord. Thank you very much. 
My Lords, the uh, Trade and Cooperation Agreement uh, contained a structure of 24 committees that were going to assist the process of the trade. And following the Windsor Framework Agreement, the European Affairs Committee of this House produced a report about the future of the relationship between the UK and the EU. I do hope that the Noble Lord, the Foreign Secretary, will have a chance to read that report. One of the key themes within that report was getting these 24 committees really humming and meeting and their structures meeting as well and transacting so that the, could, there could be mutual benefit to both sides in improving the trading relationship. I wonder if the Noble Lord, the Foreign Secretary, could give us a sense of whether that is now happening and give us also a sense about his determination to keep it going. Well, I thank the Noble Lord for his question. I think that um, what I'd say is these structured dialogues do seem to work. Only yesterday the one on citizenship met, I think, for the 14th time and made some important progress. So I think there's a role for those, but I also think there's a role for using all the connections and structures that we have and other meetings we have to try and push forward British interests. And, for instance, with my meeting with Commissioner Sefcovic, there's this whole issue about having an energy partnership. I think that's an excellent idea, but we've really got to get to grips quickly with electricity trading. It makes sense. If we have, we've got these interconnectors, let's trade the electricity, let's try and have lower prices here and lower prices there. It's, it's an obvious example of you know, win-win cooperation, as it were, um, but a, a more structured dialogue at the same time, of course. And I will certainly read the report to which he refers, which I haven't yet seen. My lords, my lords, my lords. My lords. I'm delighted that my noble friend decided to come to this place, uh, a decision that uh, is probably much wiser than the one he made when he sent me here. Um, <laughs> may, may I um, ask him about relations with Greece? Uh, and I declare my interest in the Register and as a member of the Parthenon Project, whose objective is to create a, a privately funded foundation to encourage exchanges of teachers and, and, and professors and students between our two countries, uh, and also to share in our priceless cultural objectives uh, and artefacts, which uh, include the Elgin Marbles. Um, yes, it's not just the, uh, the, the loony left. Um, uh, may I simply say that is, in, our, in our really crappy world, is it not in our really crappy world, is it not right that we should reach out and use as much power, soft power, as we can to reforge and strengthen our relations with our old friends? Uh, well, I thank my noble friend for his question. I well remember sending him here because a week later we lost a vote by one and uh, he was the responsible uh, noble lord. And I remember having um, some words with him after that, <laughs> although <laughs> clearly that had absolutely no effect at all. Um, look, I, I don't agree with him about what he says about the um, Elgin Marbles. The government has a very clear position on that that has been, been set out. I met the Greek foreign minister while I was at the NATO conference and we had a great discussion about all the other aspects of our relationship where we're strong uh, friends, allies and partners. Lords, the, um, the Foreign Secretary, when he spoke of the issues that he was talking to the EU about, I think left off one very important one, perhaps the most significant, which that was the issue of international security. Can I take him back to those halcyon days of May 2016, he will recall them well, during the height of the EU referendum campaign, and he was then clear that, and I quote him, much closer security cooperation between our European allies and nations is essential. Now, given his previous commitment, I was surprised he didn't mention it in the list of things he was looking at at the moment, but can he say what he will do to renew and strengthen that security relationship between the EU and the UK, and including, is he willing to consider to negotiate an EU-UK security pact that will complement our commitment to NATO. Yeah. Um, well, I had a feeling that some of my past words might be served up for me, and I'm sure, as another former Prime Minister said, they'll, they'll make a very fulfilling and satisfying diet um, as I eat them. Um, what I would say is, yes, we did talk about security issues. Specifically, we talked about security in the Western Balkans when I met with uh, Commissioner Sefcovic. Uh, what I would say is, look, I think Ukraine is perhaps one of the greatest elements of proof that the UK can make this relationship of friend, neighbour and partner, rather than member, make that relationship with the EU work. We coordinate with them very closely on how we support Ukraine, on how we sanction 
um, uh, Russians and all the rest of it. And so, of course, that is part of the relationship. The other thing, frankly, that's changed is that NATO has had an enormous um, boost from Putin's actions. It is now bigger and stronger with new members joining, and that is the ultimate guarantee of our security. My Lords, the Parliamentary uh, Partnership Assembly met in the last two days. And I'm certain, my Lords, that the Foreign Secretary has some sympathy in understanding that the agreement has been a fairly harsh blow to the British overseas territories. I apologise that I missed his maiden speech in this House, because I was in the Falkland Islands, and they told me that for their fishing industry, the largest uh, part of the economy in the Falkland Islands, uh, they are now spending over £15 million a year to be Spanish-flagged vessels as a result of the lack of access to the EU market, which is their largest. I understand that the Foreign Secretary will be visiting the Falkland Islands, so will he take to them the good news that he will now negotiate an agreement that means that British fishermen uh, on British vessels fishing in British waters will not have to do so under a Spanish flag. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm happy to thank the Noble Lord for his question. I can, I can tell him that Minister Rutley from my department was actually in the Falklands um, just a couple of days ago. I'll certainly take away the point that he makes. Uh, I'm very committed to working with all our overseas territories. We had them all in the Foreign Office just a couple of weeks ago uh, to discuss a whole range of issues, and I'm happy to add that to the list. That concludes Secretary of State questions for today.